Hello and welcome to our ACCE Learning Network Hangout. It's a place where we can connect with our peer and to share practice, ideas and have a good old chin wag. A moment to network with friends across the world as we work out the machinations and changes that Google and other online web tools inflicts upon us. A very flat world of growing number of flat classroom links. Amanda. And as usual, if you're watching us live, you can post us a question by going to todaysmeet.com forward slash A-C-C-E-L-N and on Twitter you can use the hashtag A-C-C-E-L-N. And this is Hangout number 32 for 2013. I'm Roland Guesthausen, a high school teacher, e-learning leader in Victoria, Australia. I'm a state councillor of the ICTEV and in the last seven days I've survived dressing up in my Star Trek costume for Halloween night. Shock! You should have seen that. Um, I also survived the uh, VC exams. For a shout out to my VCE students who have uh, now returned to the real world of living, um, where not everything is gauged and measured by responses on a paper test. Are you implying that they are enjoying their newfound lives by watching our hangout this evening? No, probably not. They've no, probably <laughs> gone out and uh, crashed out playing computer games. <laughs> You're right, they might watch it later. <laughs> um, I'm Amanda Revlin, an e-learning coordinator in Brisbane, proud QSite member and past board member there too, and digital citizen of the world. Now tonight we have a selection of exciting individuals joining us and we might get them to uh, introduce themselves. Now Google has changed the interface for us. We usually go left to right in this process, however, um, it's kind of juggled things around. We'll go with what I believe is left to right. So Make Anne, us go alphabetical like by to... last name. We have to work it out as we go. Oh, I don't think my brain's up to that, Chris. You can work out the list and we'll do our final summaries <laughs> that way. How's that sound? That's your task. Um, Anne, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Merchant, an ICT teacher in Victoria. Uh, I teach in a small rural school, prep to year 12, and I've been a member of the Flat Classroom Projects for I think about six, seven years now, and have learnt so much with them, from them, and I love being part of this session tonight. So thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, and a truly inspirational teacher. We're glad you can join us, even though your bandwidth is low and we only get audio. It's fabulous to have you. Bruce. Bruce. Bruce, you're currently muted. Would you like to unmute yourself and then introduce yourself? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Much Excellent. better. Not accustomed to this. I saw myself over on the far right and thought I'd get to go last for a change. But second it is. Um, Bruce from Canberra. I haven't been in one of these things for a while, so it's good to get back. Now that volleyball season is over, I should be dropping in a little bit more regularly. So good to be back. Wonderful and great to have representation from the ACT with us. <laughs> now I might split, skip to Chris because I noticed Cameron you've just joined us um, but we'll give you a time to get adjusted before letting you um, be thrown into the gauntlet of speaking. Chris, can you introduce yourself? Thanks. Uh, hi, my name's Chris Betcher coming to you directly from tonight's parents and friends meeting. <laughs> where I just got home from it. And I'm uh, celebrating today the auspicious occasion that my youngest child finally finished school today. She did her last Yay. high school certificate exam. Yay. I officially now have no children at school. <laughs> Yay. Time Quite to charge moment. board. You're a big grown-up now. <laughs> I am. Um, Cameron, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Cameron, can you hear we us can. at all? Perhaps Jason fill in while Cameron works out the buttons on his keyboard there. Jason. Well, hi all, I'm Jason Zagami. I'm up here on the Gold Coast in Queensland where I'm a lecturer at Griffith University. Fantastic. And uh, Julie? Um, hi everyone, Julie Lindsay here and uh, Oh, whew, I was just in Qatar last week at the WISE event and I met Julia Gillard and I took a selfie with Ooh. Julia Gillard, Julie and Julia. So, <laughs> and I know people might have mixed feelings about that, but I was quite excited. <laughs> so that was that, one of my thrills cool. last week. <laughs> Pleased to be here. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us. Phil. I'm on the Gold Coast in Queensland where I'm a lecturer at 
Phil, we seem to be getting a bit of sound delay coming through yours. Um, I might just give you a cue on the text when it's your turn to chat, if that makes sense. Uh, Rob, you'll need to unmute yourself first. Welcome. Uh, hi everybody, I hope, hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Rob, uh, I'm a member of the IM Australia management team. Uh, it's really good to be here and thanks for the invite Julie and um, uh, I do a lot of work with digital learning in the education department in Victoria in the southeastern region. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight's session. Wonderful, good to see you, Rob. so glad right. you could make it. Now we might get Phil to try again. If he's with Hang us. on, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Phil. How are you? Oh, good, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, Phil Brown. I'm the um, uh, Director of eLearning at Wellington Secondary College. And I'm just on my phone at the moment. I'm going to try and flip over to my desktop. So just forgive me if I drop out, OK? OK. Forgiven already. Think, and we even don't mind yeah, if there's Phil's two of you. Al used to do that by every device in his house. I'm sure at one stage he was talking through his room. Hey, well, I've that just about wraps up too. tonight's show. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Betcher. You're a funny man. Hey, look, you, thank you very much. And Chris is right, because tonight we're here to discuss the Flat Classroom Project and all the recent events and what's looming on the horizon. And I'm thinking um, this Hangout may make us feel like there's a, we're in a bit of a small world, but certainly a very diverse one. Now, Julie, as opposed to Julia, Julia, Julie, who met Julia recently, you've been a pioneer with the Flat Classroom Initiative, and I know we've had you as a special guest and perhaps a bit of a regular, really, um, in our Hangouts before. But I wonder if you would mind just giving us a brief overview of your work in this area for our viewers who may not be familiar with it. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, so the Flat Classroom uh, came about uh, seven years ago now. It's actually November 2006 uh, when the co-founder, Vicky Davis, and I put to, joined our two classrooms together. I was in Bangladesh at the International School Dhaka and Vicky's uh, in Georgia, Camilla, Georgia in uh, the USA. And Web 2.0 had just sort of become you know, available in the classroom and uh, with our hangouts and before, blogs. But I wonder if you would mind just giving us a brief overview of your work in this area for our viewers who may not be familiar with it. And uh, that's okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> and uh, we thought, uh, well, we should join our classrooms together so that the students can work together at a distance. So we did that. We, we, we actually developed the first flat classroom project. And so uh, someone needs to keep their speaker turned down. That would be a good idea. OK, sure, keep going. Uh, from that first project where we actually, what we call flattened the walls of the classroom, it wasn't just Vicky and myself and our uh, 40 kids or whatever. We actually had expert advisors. We had judges. I mean, Jeff Utecht was one of our original judges seven years ago. Um, and um, uh, we, we, we saw the power that this sort of uh, cloud-based learning, this sort of flattened collaborative learning, uh, had within our, you know, within our own, our own learning environment. So, so we decided to create more projects. Um, I moved to Qatar from Bangladesh. I was teaching in Qatar for a couple of years, and while we were in Qatar, we actually had the opportunity to also run a live event. We had sponsorship uh, in the Middle East there to run a live event. So. So the Flat Classroom Project became the Flat Classroom Conference in 2009 and we were able to bring in, uh, we probably had about 40 students and about 60 or so teachers. Many of them came in from outside of Qatar. Anne was one of them who came in. So Anne can uh, talk from experience about what happened in Qatar. But we really created this learning environment where uh, we put students and teachers in teams and students in particular worked with you know, people they had never actually met before, people who were of different cultures to them uh, and people even of different languages and different language abilities, but they worked together in teams to actually envision uh, uh, solutions to perceived global issues. So that was sort of the start of, of the live events. Um, and of course, since then, uh, we've, we've got about seven or eight global collaborative projects that we run regularly every year, most of them twice a year. Uh, we also do uh, 
uh, teacher professional development. So we have a flat classroom certified teacher course that is accredited through the University of Northern Iowa. And uh, we run workshops and, and live events uh, where we can. So that's it in a nutshell, really, I think. Thank you, and what a fine nutshell, so much in it. <laughs> I'm just wondering uh, what kinds of projects have actually come out of the uh, conference and um, prior to that, the Flat Classroom Project Initiative. I think we've got a few people on our panel tonight that have actually been involved in that too. So perhaps, Julie, if you wanted to um, give us a brief in, uh, overview of some of the things and then throw to some of your special guests you've invited this evening. Sure, I'm going to throw to Anne in a minute um, because Anne has been very involved uh, with our projects and our live events. But we've got uh, we've got the Flat Classroom Project, which is still running pretty much in its original format, which involves students working in mixed teams, expert advisors interacting with expert advisors, creating multimedia for uh, global judges to to look at and review. Um, we have the digital uh, citizenship project called Digiteen. We have that for younger students and older students. Uh, we have uh, a project that actually came out of the 2009 conference that we used to call a racism, but I've rebranded it th this year and it's called Global Youth Debates. And it's actually an asynchronous debating project. So once again, uh, students create a, a debating team, it's a formal debate, uh, they have a team in their school and they debate asynchronously with another team in another part of the world. Uh, so we use a, a tool called VoiceThread to do that. And um, we have projects for the K-2 to grade levels and the grade 3 to 5 grade levels. And I think one of the unique things about what we do with Flat Classroom is our, and you know, there are all, lots of wonderful global projects in the world now. But what we do, I think, is we have managed global collaborative opportunities for teachers. And a lot of our teachers uh, are still new to Web 2.0, new to global collaboration, and we provide that, that cushioned support to get them through a 12-week project. And we also build community around the project. So we have regular teacher meetings in, a, in Blackboard or in a tool called Fusebox, uh, and we hold teachers' hands and, and build this sort of supportive learning community amongst the educators to support the students and the learning that happens in the classroom. But Anne, I wonder if you'd like to say something about your experience with Flat Classroom. Uh, I first heard about Flat Classroom projects on Twitter and I think it might have been through Kim Cofino because they were looking for students to be a sounding board and look at the students who were actually in the project and give them some feedback and I think that might have been six years ago. The next year we actually got involved in Flat Classroom projects. So my students are culturally and geographically isolated. So for them, they don't even work with students in my own classroom. They're grouped with students across the world and they have the most amazing networking opportunities. They learn to use wikis, socialise on a ning, get to know each other. They are pushed outside their comfort zone because we've also participated in the student summits where they have to reflect on their learning and share with the world in um, a virtual classroom where people across the world can come in and listen to them. Um, they create videos and the bit they love most is they have to request a little video clip uh, from students in the project that would reflect their learning from the topic that they've been placed in. So this little outsourced clip um, <laughs> I can't smile, Roland, my video is off because I have poor bandwidth. Um, they love to get these little video clips and then insert it into their own. So I think the tools that they learn in theory are now made absolutely real for them because they're actually using them at a great educational advantage. So we've been in flat classroom projects, the Net Gen Ed project, uh, which is really, really good. We look at the Horizon Port and merge that with or blend it with Don Tapscott's um, book. And last year I did the K2 projects because I taught prep and I had no idea how to teach ICT to prep. I'm a secondary teacher. And I love that one because the support of teachers, um, the mentoring of Julie to help us through, it's a really amazing experience to be in. 
Okay, enough from me. Thanks, Anne. That's great. And, uh, you know, I think we see many teachers come back year after year. In fact, the, the best thing, of course, is when teachers say, oh, well, Flat Classroom Project is part of my curriculum now. And we have a number of teachers who yeah. say that. Second semester, I will always run Flat Classroom Project and as long as it's available. So, so that's where the true um, power starts to, to be felt because it, it is embedded into the curriculum and becomes a, you know, a meaningful uh, activity. Julie, can I interrupt for a minute? Sorry, sure. can I just say, I forgot the conferences. Um, I took three <laughs> girls over to Qatar, which was an amazing experience. Oh, am I, yeah, it was an amazing experience. The Flat Classroom Conference wasn't only for the participants in the conference, there was virtual participants. So the parents back in Australia, who were quite worried about their children being in the Middle East at that time, were able to see the conference, see their students actually presenting their learning, etc. So it was just great for our school, the community. And the second year we went to Mumbai, which was another big cultural shock for the students. But again, absolutely fabulous to experience. So I encourage any of you who are thinking about it, just do it. <laughs> Good. And uh, that's all. Oh, someone's put the screenshot. That's our wiki portal. Uh, and the flat classroom port, the conference portal, of course, is, is a bit different now. Flatconnections.com is the conference portal, but uh, the the point of the live event, of course, is to really break through some of these stereotypes that we have of different cultures, different people around the world, and and it's just uh, we we ran we we ran a conference in Beijing in 2011, and we ran a conference in Japan earlier this year in uh, March 2013, and we had. Um, uh, about 80 to 100 students and about the same number of adults. Flatconnections.com. Who's, who's doing the screen share there? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm it's spelling, just... Yeah, I'm having trouble spelling connections. It's all right. No. <laughs> it's been a long day. That's okay. Well, there's flatclassroomconference.com and that's, that's actually... I'm moving everything. It says I'm moving everything to Flat Connections. Uh, that's where the new portal is. <laughs> Flatconnections.com. But, um, but the flat, the flatclassroomconference.com uh, website has the the archives there for uh, for the work that we've done in the past. But it's really, but we're we've, sure. Yes, go ahead. So for a school who says the, this all sounds great and I'd love to be involved with it but I feel like, I, and, and I'm speaking from the point of view of some of my teachers I work with, um, they would look at something like this and go, this sounds great, I'd love to be involved in it but I have this thing called a curriculum that I need to get done and deliver. Um, how do I make this merge together? How do I make this work? What do I tell mm. them? Sure. Well, I think the thing is to, to look at what your curriculum is and then look at uh, combining uh, collaborative work within that curriculum. Now, and this is where, you know, our projects aren't, don't necessarily fit into a lot of the curriculum that's out there. So one thing that we do, of course, is invite people to come and learn how to redesign curriculum so that it is global and collaborative. Uh, and that's something we do through our certified teacher course. That's something we particularly do at the conference, at the live event. You know, we say, well, come and work with other teachers. Come and spend some time learning what it means to flatten your classroom and to work out how you can actually uh, embed global collaboration into what you do or what you need to do in your curriculum. So it's certainly not all about our projects. Not, it's not all about you know, flat classroom projects. It's about best practice pedagogy for using emerging technologies and uh, embedding those into your curriculum for global collaboration. So to, for a teacher who gets involved in one of your projects, is it, is it typically something that takes up uh, a certain number of hours a week or is it deeply embedded and it takes over the whole curriculum? Like how, how does it typically fit in? 
Well, it depends. Now, for example, a great, the Grade 3 to 5 project that we're running is called A Week in the Life, which is a, a simple project where students share what's happening in their life, their schools, their you know, what transport they have around them, what their landscape looks like, etc. And um, it's a great inquiry-based project. It's a great project for students to start uh, being part of a community and using a tool called Edmodo, introducing themselves, creating their avatar, avatar all of this uh, digital citizenship stuff. Um, and you know, teachers can tell me they do that in I don't know three to four hours a week, perhaps six hours a week. So it's certainly you know, as a primary school teacher, it's certainly not something that takes over their whole their whole curriculum, mm -hmm. but it is something that they can refer to perhaps on a daily basis or. Uh, every second day and then perhaps build in a few more hours as the multimedia projects are due towards the end of the uh, project. And Anne's just it's put a, a note in there, she's blended into the Year 11 VCE curriculum. So That's a really good question, Chris, because we're so locked into the idea that um, we may be teaching leaders in week three in science. or. Um, I, I once was, uh, we had an eclipse um, in Melbourne um, about a decade ago and I was asked could it be rescheduled to another time when it would better suit, because we teach astronomy at the end of the year. Um, there is a just-in-time type stuff where you could begin to weave in um, connections. I, I don't think the kids are too dislocated by it. It's often us educators who are so locked into our prescriptive curriculums and spreadsheets that um, mm. fail to see the potential of being able to leverage some change, have just-in-time learning um, and be able to make these connections. Um, I, I wonder, Julie, though, um, do you find that um, those schools that are able to do that um, see new opportunities when they maybe repeat it for the second or third time? They begin to see new connections and new uses beyond just joining and um, swapping and sharing? Yes, yes, they do. And it becomes, I mean, really, they, they, they start to understand what connected learning is, what flat learning is. And it's really, you know, flat classroom or connected learning, very similar. Um, it's a pedagogy. It's it's an it's an approach to teaching and learning, which really is separate to actual projects. I mean, projects are one thing, and not everyone can take on a twelve-week project and, and commit to it, etc. Uh, therefore, you know, I recommend they design their own that might be a bit shorter, etc. But uh, the actual approach to learning that is connected and collaborative and and involves not just creation but co-creation. Of products with people at a distance. I mean that—that's really what we call flat learning. And so, um, Julie, if a yeah. if a, if a project is often the starting point for teachers to be involved in this, where does it evolve to as um, things kind of take their own path or the innovations kind of evolve? Where does it evolve in terms of the the school, the classroom, the yeah, if, if the Flat Classroom um, conference and the projects that, that um, you run are actually a starting point for teachers in terms of getting connected and collaborating, um, once they have got a feel for being a connected educator and a connected learner, what comes next in that process for them? Uh, I think what comes next is uh, really looking at where they can embed collaboration right across the whole school. and, and encouraging colleagues and really you know you move from being a flat uh, educator to a flat school to really flattening the learning of the students and and encouraging the students to be flat learners as well and you know I, I've used the word flat and connected interchangeably it's really very very similar you know if we, if we uh, you know we're looking at this sort of connectivism this um, and I met George Siemens last week too at WISE which was really great mm. <laughs> to have a chat with George the whole uh, connectivism learning theory, or maybe some people don't think it's a learning theory. Maybe Jason can tell us <laughs> his, his opinion about that. Uh, but the other thing is, of course, it, I think it helps people to, to um, you know, it engages, it's, it's engages the learning uh, in so many different ways, and it helps people to, to look at alternatives as well. And I, we have a couple of other people in the room. We've got Rob and we've got Virginia, who's just joined us. Uh, who are from the uh, Australian IEARN organisation. Of course, IEARN have been uh, doing global collaborations for many more years than Flat Classroom, of course. In fact, they were one of my main inspirations for years. Uh, I was a great IEARN supporter and, uh, and teacher in different countries around the world. But, but um, you know, I'd really be interested to see what, uh, what Rob has to say in terms of the development of global collaborative curriculum 
in Australia and, and where we are and, and where we should be heading, perhaps. Rob, would you like to, to uh, chime in at this stage? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julie. Um, assuming people can hear, okay. But um, yeah, look, I think yep. there's some real challenges uh, with the with the Australian curriculum, and particularly around uh, intercultural understanding with the Australian curriculum. I think I think there's a real imperative there for all teachers, all schools, to actually look at how they are going to actually embed this into the curriculum. And we're not just talking about uh, intercultural understanding being one subject within the curriculum, the, the essence of it is really that it's a, a cross-curriculum, that it's throughout, pervasive throughout the school. And I think schools are going to be challenged with how they actually engage with actually providing these uh, authentic opportunities for students to actually be involved in not just learning about other places, but actually uh, collaborating and actually working with students from other places, other other um, systems throughout the world, other countries, other other cultures throughout the world. And I think uh, Flat Classroom, along with uh, IOM projects and a lot of other of the global, global collaborative um, uh, networks, are going to be things that schools need to embrace in order to be able to have some sort of uh, structured network in order to be able to um, actually integrate some of this work within their school. It's a challenging environment for them because uh, we'd probably have to say that up until now the people that have been involved in global collaboration have been people that have seen that um, seen that need or had the opportunity within their classroom or have been teaching in a in an area that's enabled them to be able to do it and quite often they're the passionate people to begin with. I think what we now face is a challenge where schools that might, might not have those people within their within their staff at the present time all of a sudden being uh, having to start thinking about how are they going to actually implement some of these facets of the Australian curriculum, uh, you know, connecting with Asia and the intercultural understanding stuff, how are they going to do that and who are they going to draw on in terms of networks to be able to uh, figure out how they're going to integrate those into the curriculum. So I think the Flat Classroom initiative and those and those um, opportunities that that provides along with the other networks are going to be vital for schools. That's it for now. <laughs> Thanks Rob and I think just to pick up on what Rob was saying, uh, you know there's a lot of talk about going global these days and uh, often teachers think that um, a Skype call. Let, let's Skype with Vietnam. Let's Skype with China. Let's Skype with whoever uh, is going is going global. But you know, it, it's <laughs> Chris says well, that's not it. No, it's not it. It's a start, and it's engaging and it's exciting. But it's not. Uh, it 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 doesn't really embed cultural understanding, and it's really about no. not learning about the world, but learning with and from the world, is is the important thing. Where, where I find that really. An, uh, bothersome and I've had teachers do this in the past where they'll say can you set up a you know we're learning about Vietnam can you set up a call with Vietnam or Indonesia or whatever and you you you, you go and find a connection and you make the connection and it's like great well we'll connect with them we'll ask them some questions and that'll be the end of it and it's like well what, what are you going to do for them well we're not going to do anything for them we just want to talk to them about what they can do for us and it's it's a very interesting um, mindset that that people see the global collaboration thing as uh, you know pimping out some other school to ask, ask a few questions from, but that's it, and it really needs to be way more than that. It does, and this so is I, where this is where teachers don't really understand what to do next. That that's the point. Jason, were you going to say yeah. something? No, it was me, Julie. But one, see, one of the things I think people do. It's Bruce. One of the things oh, people okay, do Bruce, when they um. That's all right. When they're looking at how they can take advantage of some of this stuff, and I think it's where the intercultural understanding aspect of the Australian curriculum is going to be really important. One of the things they do is they, they look at that from the perspective of what they're currently doing now. And I think that's where a lot of the problems that teachers have with getting this stuff off the ground come from. I think they're, that a lot of teachers, and you know, some of them are fantastic at what they're doing now, but I think you, know, you need to consider what it is our students are demanding from us, and I think that's changed. And I really am not sure that you know 
I, th I think I think it's fantastic what we're talking about, but I don't know if teachers will be confident picking it up because of the fear that they're not going to be able to get through the curriculum because that's what's driving their decision making about what they want to be involved in. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for, some, for those reluctant teachers to get involved in a project like this, I think ultimately what we're going to need to see is when, when projects are finished, maybe some process afterwards where you draw back on that project to identify where the Australian curriculum has been covered, what specific content has been explored, and maybe provide advice as to how a teacher being involved in something like this later on could um, could ensure that content that needs to be covered gets covered without it being too contrived, which I know would probably be a really difficult thing to balance. But they're the they're the challenges I see um, on the ground from teachers who maybe do put, you know, I must get through this content description. I I must get through this particular um, topic before I can I can go any further. Um, yeah, it's a real barrier, and I don't know if there's a really yeah. simple answer to that one. And, and part of the problem, Bruce, is that we still see content as something to be covered, and you know we still see learning in terms of delivering content, and content is something to be covered, and a curriculum is something that needs to be delivered and covered, and it's just, it's it's not about that. It's about uncovering curriculum, not discovering, not not covering curriculum. Absolutely, and it's about hey. yeah. Sorry, I was just going to um, maybe suggest that Anne could share some of her experience as well in terms of um, how she's actually made those connections to the curriculum through being involved in these types of things. I teach VCE IT, so we are um, given a very stringent curriculum, but I find I can fit it in, I think, quite nicely. Uh, we study online communities, um, web page design, Oh, I need my curriculum course in front of me, but um, just so many elements of the flat classroom project fit into, or the net gen ed project, I should say, fit into that um, uh, part of the curriculum. Uh, I think the intercultural understanding, the different forms of communication, you know, we're not just there writing text now. Students are learning how to connect online with virtual tools like Google Hangouts or Skype, etc., etc., and they're learning real 21st century skills that will be used in their life beyond school. Yeah, Jason, and, I want and that's the thing. Yeah. And yeah, let's let's go to Jason because Jason's put this comment comment in about student centered learning and of course that's that's what it's all about. <laughs> go on, Jason. <laughs> I I certainly agree that that pedagogically that's where we'd like everyone to be but a lot of the international projects and many of the sort of precursors of classrooms and so forth have been about teachers creating the connections and the relationships and so forth but in a really student-centered learning environment the students would be connecting with other students and other people around the world um, if you've got foreign students connecting back to their home countries or their friends and so forth and having that global culture just as a seamless part of the school learning environment, not seen as a special project, but just as a natural extension um, of the use of the technology that enables them to do so. Yes, and yet, um, yet interestingly, we, we, we actually block that by the very nature mm. of the way that our networks are designed and our policies are written and all of the other things like that, particularly us in government schools, we find that very, very difficult because we're essentially told students cannot communicate outside of this very, very clearly defined walled area. and I mean, you know, we do our best to get around some of those restrictions, but it's a really, really important distinction to make. Mm, well, you know, that's that's where flattening the walls is so important. And um, I mean, I, I, I don't have all the answers for certain situations in Australia. I don't have all the answers for certain situations across the world. I know I taught in, I've taught in the Middle East, I've taught in China. I mean, you talk about flat learning in China where so many things are blocked, but I still was able to run flat classroom projects with people all around the world from these different countries. So so sometimes I think it's it's partly teacher attitude, it's partly teacher motivation. Uh, and of course it's um, we do we do need to move away from this top-down content heavy approach to learning. And uh, you know, we want our students to be connected learners, and I think 
in many respects we are we're shutting the gate and we're holding them back because you know if you start a, a kindergarten student doing global collaboration this year, next year in grade one they do more, next year in grade two they do more. Imagine what that student is going to be like when they reach middle and high school. You know, they will be globally competent, they'll be technology savvy, they'll know how to, to work in a synchronous and asynchronous learning environment and you know things will be um, a lot more fluent and connected and collaborative than they are now. And then we'll start to solve some of the world's problems. You know, that's, that's my ideal learning within situation. Res within restricted environments, um, you can, though, get the students to actually engage outside of the restricted environments when they're at home and so forth for homework or for other activities to mm -hmm. make those linkages and then slowly draw that into the classroom and then hopefully that, by its own nature, will corrode the barriers that exist within our school systems at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think the thing is not not to be, as long as you make sure you're not the obstacle. As long as the teacher makes sure that they're not the obstacle. I know we all have to work sometimes within our work environments. Though I've usually been one that's sort of jumped over or gone around or somehow I found a way. Uh, and just mm. keep looking for ways around it and keep talking to people and keep coming to uh, conferences like the Flat Classroom Conference. Uh, to see how it's done because uh, it really is about looking at the pedagogy and looking at curriculum redesign. And Anne says she always finds a way to. <laughs> Some really interesting discussions here tonight. And we're looking at ways that we can make uh, conversations and collaborations a lot more deeper than just this cursory um, exchange of information and a disconnect. I like the idea of students perhaps taking a greater role in actually steering some of those connections and relationships. Um, one of the projects I'm involved with is uh, GLOBE and uh, we exchange weather information, which is interesting because that's a lot easier to do than some of the other things that get swapped around. Um, but I often wonder that sometimes the connections that we make are quite trivial and flippant and um, I like the idea of being able to engage in a much wider, deeper dialogue. Is there an opportunity for doing that, Julie, beyond um, just swapping stuff? I mean, do the kids really grab some of those international issues that in the different areas and, and run with them? Are they a lot more savvy in being able to deal with those international things and be taken for granted, perhaps? Well, it's, um, it depends. Uh, I think when we get students at, at our conference, they certainly have time, they have really intense focused time to look at some of these issues and to to brainstorm it and work through, we work through a design cycle, design thinking to get them to um, pitch ideas to teachers and then teachers pitch their ideas to students. It's a whole process we run through. Our conferences are unique because we have teachers and students at the same conference and the thinking does go a lot deeper uh, and the outcomes are, are quite amazing really. Uh, some of our projects, for example, our, our Global Youth Debates project, students get to go dig a lot deeper with that because they are actually you know, putting together formal debating but they bounce off each other in terms of what's happening in each country and they learn more about the global aspects of the topic that they're debating as well. But, uh, you know, I really feel like as, as good as it all is, we've only just scratched the surface. We really have in terms of, once again, student initiated learning, student inquiry based learning and um, and um, connected and collaborative learning modes. Um, if I could just jump in for a minute. <clears throat> um, we're really just at the beginning of all of this and uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, we would really like to start establishing some links with um, other schools overseas but haven't got the foggiest idea on how to do it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Come to our conference. <laughs> Come to the flat classroom conference. That would be one way to do it. Sydney next June. Um, but also, you know, join some networks. There's another great conference coming up in two weeks' time. Anne and I are both keynoting uh, the Global Education Conference, globaleducationconference.com. And this is a totally free, totally online conference. And you just you meet virtually educators from all around the world and learn so much. It's an intense uh, five days. So uh, globaleducationconference.com is one. Uh, you can come and join. Sorry, I need to put some of these in the window here. Annie, are you still there? Can you put some stuff in the window <laughs> while I talk? Um, 
I'm not my typing's not quick enough. Um, the other, of course, then you can join our flat classrooms .ning .com, um, uh, teacher network. We have uh, a few thousand teachers there, uh, just focused on meeting other teachers and global education, etc. And then, of course, you know Steve Hargaden, who's based in the States. He has a number of networks. Uh, classroom Two O. I mean, he's got like sixty or seventy thousand educators on his Classroom Two O uh, network. So you know, these are all starting points. But then it's really understanding what you do once you've actually made a connection. And this is where, you know, like Rob and, and Virginia here, of course, understand this perfectly. You know, you really actually have to it, plan and decide what that connection is going to look like and how you're going to join your students together and your teachers for um, uh, meaningful sort of collaborations. And, um, yeah, that's it. Global Education Conference is coming up in two weeks' time. And just, uh, just a word about going back to what we're running in Sydney next year, in June, at the Shaw School in Sydney, the Flat Classroom Conference. And uh, I earn people, uh, Virginia and Rob, perhaps, uh, hopefully, will be there. And one of the outcomes from that conference is we really want uh, teachers to design projects that will be implemented in schools in the next semester or the next year. And, uh, you know, Flat Classroom and Ion are going to do a, a partnership on this. Uh, to help support each other and uh, really ask uh, we're going to run through the you know the seven steps to flatten your classroom we're going to run look at flat classroom pedagogy and global project design and look at how to build meaningful projects from what is already established curriculum so that that would be one thing that we do so Virginia I don't, I don't know if your microphone's working did you want to say something or Rob did you want to hop in again and say anything um, about some of our aims for the conference next year. And thank, thanks, uh, Roland. Yeah, that was the that was the screenshot of the student summit. So, yeah. <coughs> Rob, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm not sure the Virginia's uh, connection is <laughs> helping mm. out very much, so I'll hold sure. in her place. But uh, yeah, basically, uh, it's a pretty exciting opportunity actually, where Ion will actually be part of and sponsoring some some teachers to actually attend the flat classroom project. And what we're really looking at there is perhaps some of the Ion teachers and some of the flat classroom teachers at the conference will actually join together to form a new network with uh, having a look at developing a, a project outcome from that, uh, which is a really great initiative, I think, and uh, should be something pretty exciting for those people involved. Uh, we're not sh completely sure of what the shape of that will actually be yet, but uh, I guess we're looking uh, that that will form a new sort of collaborative network of educators uh, that will look at some of the issues around providing and um, setting up a, a collaborative project and helping them with a guided sort of uh, process through that um, establishment of the project, design of the project, establishment of the project, and then actually incorporation of the project into their curriculum. I think uh, part of that work of the design of the project will come out of the flat classroom work at the conference, uh, which will be really, really great. And so the idea is that some of the ideas that generate through the conference will then be the triggers or the starting points for some of the ex the ongoing work that happens between the two organisations. And I might also say that um, for for um, uh, Phil, uh, I earns another place you could go to uh, for looking for networks of um, collaboration. There's uh, over 130 countries involved um, uh, with schools uh, through I earn network and, you know, at any given time, 150, 200 different projects running. So um, you know, there's generally something that you can you can find that might be able to fit in. But once you've joined IEARN, um, uh, there's a teachers forum as well. So you can quite often, you, and there are, there are other organisations as well where you can actually just find a place where you can actually just put some messages in and say, look, I'm, this is what I'm teaching, this is what I'd like to see happening within my classroom, within my school, and just see what sort of feedback you get from uh, from educators around the world. Uh, you never know what hey, you might just Rob? Yeah. For those of us who thought that IEARN was a bank owned by Apple, um, what does it <laughs> actually stand for? IEARN is uh, International 
uh, education and resource network. I mean, it's one of those <laughs> funny things that it's been around for a long, long time. And when when the name first started, it it sort of didn't have any other connotation. But uh, these days, I think a lot of people actually wonder exactly what it's all about, and is it about uh, earning money of some mm -hmm. sort? In fact, it's not for profit organisation, and uh, yeah, the name sort of doesn't <laughs> doesn't really do it any justice. But uh, essentially, yeah, the it's other just thing, uh, I always look at it and think it's learn.org and then think you've misspelt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly, yeah. So uh, worth having a look at anyway. But uh, I think the important thing from t tonight's session is that, um, you know, Iron and uh, Flat Classroom Project will be looking at what what can develop out of that conference. And so mm -hmm. it's an exciting phase for both of us, I think. And just a quick word about our theme of the conference too, which you can find from the Flat Connections website. Our theme is What's the Other Story? Now every conference we run around the world has a different theme, so this is quite unique. And uh, we're looking at uh, trying to break through stereotypes and and enhance better understanding of the world through finding and exploring uh, other stories. So, for example, you know, what's the story of Africa? We tend to have this this image about Africa, and even last week when I was at a very international conference at Wise people still refer to Africa as like the one place. Of course, we all know there's many countries in Africa and many different stories. So there isn't just one story. And, and there are so many things in the world where, where we, we, we tend to not be able to get past those stereotypes. So, so the underlying theme of the conference is to try and understand the stories. And you know, students and teachers will have their stories. And we'll have uh, facilitators there who will have their stories. And through sharing these stories and exploring them at a deeper level, uh, you know, we plan to to come up with some some great projects, some great initiatives from the students that can be implemented after the conference. Nice. That's really interesting, and I, I actually had some experience with yeah with the Iron conference. Now, my involvement with Iron goes back to 1994, 95. Chap called Bill Coppinger um, from uh, Broadmeadows, I think, or um, what was it? Uh, Broadford Secondary College. I remember helping him move the tables for a fundraising night. We were having a raffle to raise some money for IM projects. <laughs> they are going to buy another Mac Classic because they'd managed to get their first Macintosh by saving Safeway Shopper Dockets, I think it was. And uh, it was a wonderful project. And you know what? The enthusiasm those kids had with a really clappy old modem and one connection yeah. and just coming up and asking the questions um, with a very rudimentary um, internet. That's authentic, and it's just really nice to see um, the kind of bubbling that happens here. I kind of was worried that when kids begin to do this kind of stuff, Julie, really, that um, they get overawed about the technology. I mean, who cares about getting an email across the other side of the world? And it seems to me that there's a real bubbling passion amongst um, the uh, different people in the, the flat classroom project. Um, they still think it's fun. Um, how do you keep it? Is it just your raw energy, or it's just it's a great idea and it works well? <laughs> A bit of both. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, kids are kids. Kids get excited about lots of great things, and give an opportunity, give an opportunity to work with their hands on the tools, but in a collaborative environment where they're asked to actually think, and develop, and envision, and re you know, design and redesign, and really come up with something substantial. And the students in the student summit at, the, at our conference. Uh, do need to produce as a team a, a product uh, that they can carefully explain through a piece of multimedia as well as, as verbally. So, so they're going to be working with them. Um, if you look at the facilitators that are coming, of course Chris is coming. Thank you, Chris. Chris will be one of our main multimedia facilitators. We've also got a guy coming from um, uh, the USA, Frank uh, Gutler, uh, who's been working with us for, he's worked uh, through three conferences. He was there at the original Qatar conference. Uh, so he's he's a multimedia person. And we've got, um, you know, Anne coming. And I've, I've just had confirmation. We've got uh, Anne Michelson coming from Norway, who is an IEARN teacher. Now, she's also known for uh, Anne and her students co-wrote co a book called Connected Learners, which has uh, been getting a lot of traction in recent months. But uh, we're bringing Anne in from Norway. 
uh, for the event as well because it is an international event. I know there'll be hopefully there'll be a lot of Australian teachers and students there as well, but that you know we're making it as international as we can as well. So I've already had some inquiries from, of course, from outside of Australia, and that's the whole point that there will be different cultures, different um, hopefully you know different language abilities. I know that the the school in Indonesia who have been to the last two conferences, they've already contacted me, and their students are just gorgeous because they're they're very um, Indonesian, quite different to the quite different to Australian students, and um, you know we, we'll get that blend, that cultural blend, and 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 just set it up so that they can work together successfully. What else can I tell you? <laughs> I would add like one to that, Julie, and that is that uh, as yeah. someone who's done some of these kinds of projects in the past, that it, it changed the way I view everything about education. And even for the times when I'm not doing things that are global and collaborative and working in teams and all that sort of stuff, just the normal run of the mill day to day stuff that you have to do in a teaching classroom that's, you know, relatively unconnected. It totally changed my outlook on everything about education, and so nothing has been the same since. That's been really powerful for me. That not only has it changed the collaborative stuff, it's changed everything. And I think that's, um, and that's why you know, Chris, I'm gathering people like you around me. <laughs> I've got Rob and Virginia, and you and Anne, and and Anne from Norway, and just people who who have that innate understanding, so that we can together share this with the people who come to the conference and share it with the uh, people who come physically and virtually. There will be virtual participants at the conference because we do harness all the tools of technology that we can uh, to, to do this and there will be virtual team members and virtual, we use stream, we usually use stream or video stream uh, the event and um, it's, it's uh, as a live event it's extremely active so you know um, when, when we do post-conference surveys, I always get teachers who say, well, I wish you'd told us it was going to be so active because, you know, really we just wanted to sit there and listen to other people talk. <laughs> and so heads up, it's not sitting and listening. It's actually a lot of walking. A lot of walking. Well, so it depends what the school is. Um, it's a lot of movement. It's a lot of um, sh we do short keynotes. Uh, we do this and that and some boot camp work and but lots of opportunities to share with each other, teachers sharing with students, students sharing with teachers and and building on uh, on ideas and projects. Cool. So That's it's next. Um, I've got a question yeah. from the panel uh, from Paula. Yeah. And the question is sure. that global collaboration affordances should be assessed using the SAMA model. And uh, perhaps if someone else could explain um, what the SAMA model is. Oh, oh, oh. No, I thought that would take you. Go, Chris. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, let someone else do it. That's fine. Well, substitution to heading to redefinition, isn't it? Yes. And you think we should assess ask, those yes. projects along that same criteria and those goals? I mean, yep. would that help with the application um, with the schools and where it fits in with the curriculum? Yes, I think so, and that's something we will be um, we will be raising as part of the leadership workshop at the conference as well. That's something I usually uh, bring into any workshops that I that I um, run now. It's important. It's important to look at. You know, are, are we using technology to substitute certain things, or are we are we actually redefining the way that we teach and learn? And that really is where flat classroom comes in. It's nice because I think for the for the people who. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say for the people who are bothered about these kind of measurements. I mean, the the reading that I did about SAMA I thought was interesting, and and for anyone who's listening that doesn't know, in a nutshell, it's basically saying that if you're going to use technology, you can use it to substitute things you that you currently do using you know pen and paper, or you can modify things that you're currently doing, or you can completely start to substitute uh, to um, augment them and then um, redefine them, uh, and and start to do things that you couldn't do with without technology uh, and that's really one, where you want to head. But what's, what I found is interesting is, um, so it's SAMR, SAMR, uh, Substitution, Augmentation, um, Modification, Redefinition. In the first two of those, Substitution and Augmentation, there's effectively no um, effect on learning, uh, apparently. The, 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 
if you're measuring the effect of technology, technology and the change on learning, it's it's barely noticeable. But once you get into the um, uh, modification and redefinition phases, I think for modification you start to see improvements. And again, I I'm not going to get into an argument about how you measure this stuff, but they say that when you get into the modification phase, you start to see improvement of um, one standard deviation and into the uh, redefinition stage, they say improvements of two standard de deviations, which if you're statistically minded is relatively significant. Jason may have something to say about that. <laughs> oh, um, certainly there's um, measures of change to pedagogy and as teachers adopt the more complex um, augmentation, modification, then redefinition sort of processes. But I think changes to learning is still being um, still being measured and verified yet. One mm. interesting thing though is that talking to colleagues in the US and in the UK, they're quite um, impressed that with both the SAMA and the TPAC model, they're widely known throughout Australia. And we have a common language with those two models for discussing such things. Um, the SAMA and the TPAC model are only sort of known in scattered um, clusters in the US and the UK and they use a whole lot of other different models but we're quite unique in Australia that we've sort of adopted two um, models almost uniformly across Australia and we all discuss them together. That's a very rare thing globally. I reckon it'd be good to cover SAMA and TPAC on another night. There's some really good stuff there. Yeah. Um, I'm also just conscious of the time and uh, We've had a really good discussion tonight, weaving in so many different things, and I think I've come to terms with the Google Gremlins that have stopped hijacking my browser here, so I can uh, talk about it flashing across the screen of strange features in strange places. Um, perhaps we'll do, if it's all right with you guys, is do a bit of a wrap, um, some closing thoughts. Um, I'll start from left to right. Just remember that um, we'll hear the cue from um, Amanda, who will be uh, calling you to introduce yourself. And just be conscious of the fact that some of you actually have your microphones muted. You may have to unmute them. Amanda. I had hoped Chris would get back to us with the um, alphabetical listing by surname. <laughs> but we'll start with you, Anne. Do you have any reflections um, or just a summary statement on uh, this evening's hangout? Sorry, Anne, that was you. Oh, okay, my audio is pitching in and out. I would just like to say, um, I know one flat classroom teacher said that when you go flat, you never go back. And I agree. And I think it's very difficult for us who've probably been in that flattened learning environment to remember how it was before that time. So some of the questions and comments tonight are certainly food for thought and perhaps um, helping others who wish to become flat and bring learning to a whole new level both for yourselves and your students. And I thank you very much for letting me be part of this tonight. Thank you Thanks, so Anne. much for joining Thanks. us. Uh, Bruce. Look, I think anything that gets teachers thinking differently about the way they teach is a good thing. And ultimately, the Flat Classroom Project and other projects like it really do shift the emphasis away from what is effectively a very rigid, directed, uh, teacher-directed curriculum into something that provides a lot more scope and fluidity. And I think that's what students need to be engaged in the world that we live in now. And we need to be able to show teachers how to do that effectively. So projects like this are fantastic for that. Thanks, Bruce. Chris? Um, I don't know what else to say. Um, it's common bloody sense, isn't it? Like, this is the world we live in. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't go through a single day of my day-to-day -day existence without having several video calls between people who are either here in Australia or overseas, and, and that's just normal. Um, and I just think you know, that ought to be normal everywhere, including in education. Thanks, Chris. Jason? Absolutely. Well, we don't yet have intergalactic collaborations. I think Steve. probably the strongest thing we have from our international collaborations is that it shames us in Australia that we don't have actually um, collaborations between our states and even between our sectors in our school systems and I think that by doing these projects internationally and showing the value there 
we may be able to move towards being able to do it between our states and between our school sectors here within Australia. Mm. Very good point. Thank you. Uh, Jay, uh, Julie, sorry. Oh, sorry, me next? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, sure. Um, and I think that's an important point because Flat Classroom is not just about going global. It's about good practice collaboration using emerging technologies and schools uh, have spent a lot of money, governments have spent a lot of money on technology and yes it's unfortunate that a lot of these doors are still closed, the gates are still bolted, uh, things are locked down, but you know that will change and it, it will be a grassroots uh, approach that will change it because students do want to connect, teachers want to connect and really uh, it, will, it will sort itself out and it is sorting itself out around the world to, to allow people to do this. So, you know, as we move forward down that path, the thing is to, to really know and understand how to connect in a collaborative way that in, enhances the curriculum, enhances the learning. And that's, that's where, you know, coming to something like the Flat Classroom Conference can really teach you that. And just one, one further word about the conference, you know, we all know there are lots of conferences to go to. And sometimes it's hard to make decisions and there are limited funds, etc. But I really encourage you to, to have a look at this conference. It's, it's not your typical conference. In fact, it's quite unique in the world. There, I, I don't know any other conference that runs with students and teachers at the same event uh, with a very hands-on focus uh, using the technology for learning. And, um, you know, you can go to conferences where you do learn a lot about the tools and they're great as well. Uh, and conferences where you do sit there and listen to keynote speakers all day and they're great as well. But this will give you a totally different approach and perhaps re-energise you and reinvigorate you for the pathway ahead for teaching and learning. So I encourage you to have a look at it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Talk about it today. <laughs> and the website to go to is flatconnections.com and there's a link to the uh, 2014 uh, conference there as well. I hope to come. Maybe I can see you there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yay. And Phil, mm. your reflections. Uh, yeah, thanks for, um, you know, everything tonight. It's been very interesting for me. I, I've, as I said before, we're really at the very beginning of all this and very keen um, to do something. So I'm hoping to sort of do a bit more networking and uh, getting on with it. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Rob? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's been really fantastic discussion, really, um, you know, but one thing that strikes me, and that is that uh, in a lot of forums, uh, I hear very similar threads through the discussion. And I think, I think uh, it is a grassroots thing, but I think the grassroots have been there for some time now, and I, I think we've got to explore any, any which way we can to find out how we can actually promote more and more opportunities for schools, because it's time they the grass actually got up from the roots and started to really thrive, as it is in some pockets, but we've got to find every every way that we can. Because I, I don't think it's just about, um, uh, I mean, there's, as, as was mentioned today, it's really, and, uh, it's really about the attitudes and the dispositions of students to become global learners. And that's what we do this work for. They're probably some of the key skills that young people need in today's world. And, and they, they quite often pick them up everywhere else but school and school seems to be lagging behind in terms of giving students the opportunity to do this sort of uh, collaboration. Kids in online gaming will collaborate quite incredibly powerfully in order to survive in their online games in amazing sort of ways uh, that we just can't find a way of capturing within our, our normal classrooms accepting global collaboration uh, projects. So. I think together uh, through the various networks that exist and particularly as a starting point through the flat classroom which as Jul Julie says offers teachers a really great structured sort of approach to actually um, taking on these sort, this sort of work. I think we've got to find every, every way we can to support those environments and advertise them and showcase them in any, any way that we can possibly do it because we've got to build it from my, my worry is that it's been grassroots for a long time and I would like to see how we can take that next step. Uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at and uh, uh, like I say, tonight's conversation has been fantastic. 
Really good. And well done, Julie, and look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Great. Thanks for coming time, in. Time to turn the lo the grass into lawn, I think. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> let Still it grow. The Let's not mow the lawn. Let's just let it grow. <laughs> <laughs> Go to seed. Take I over just the world. throw one more thing. A, a kid once, a kid who was part of a project I was doing once, said to me that um, he he said, if, you know, if more schools did this, there wouldn't be any wars. And I said, really? Why, why would you say that? And he went, why would I go to war with... Because uh, I'm making friends all over the world. Why would I go to war with someone who's a friend of mine? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So Julius Caesar, and that's only, the point. Julius Caesar only ever declared war on the people who refused to meet with him. Huh. <laughs> Interesting point. <laughs> now, now I, I really enjoy it because what I really enjoy is just actually using these technologies to do more than just some sort of consumer um, consumption um, or media delivery. It's actually redefining our lives, and it's moving Africa forward with these real-world links. It doesn't just happen because you cook up. It happens with what you do with that connection. And for me, it's a sign of things to come. Um, I, I see it happening when you get in Victoria. There's some wonderful educators like Paula Christofferson, and she's been sharing back with groups here some of the curriculum ideas, what's been happening with computing in the UK, um, with the kind of computational thinking that we're building into a national curriculum. And that's really wonderful when I see that collaboration happening on a statewide. And I think it's the shape of things to come when we begin to crank this up among students, um, looking at international perspective. And, and maybe they'll test some of the ideas and perceptions that are being um, handed out by the media by you know, drawing upon some of those authentic connections. When I was using the internet with my high school students back in 1992, um, it changed um, when the Iron Curtain fell and we were talking to kids in Estonia, Latvia and other countries that just popped out, popped out of nowhere. And when our kids were tweeting some of the Scud missiles flying overhead, the global connections that the flat classroom group is generating, and these new conversation stories, is helping redefine us. And I think it's going to help shape the future of how our children are going to use these technologies. I've got many more things to do in my life, but engaging kids and making the world a better place to live in, it's just wonderful, and it's on the top of my list of things to do. Julie, I want you to wish you all the best of your conference next year and helping promote it, and I want you to keep up the great work that you're doing with your team. Thank you. Thanks, Roland. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> and now for my reflection. <laughs> A fascinating discussion tonight. Um, I'm always super keen to learn what's happening from such inspirational people in my network that I'm connected to and those that I meet through just being part of this event and I hope to become more involved in um, such other fascinating projects too. Um, I have always enjoyed hearing how things like Flat Classrooms and Iron and other projects have been able to support teachers to get their classrooms connected and I think listening to the conversation today I've been challenged to explore the purpose of those meaningful connections for intercultural understanding and look for teachers in my schools where this would be the perfect next step and actually get them to do rather than um, just explore the perceptions of different cultures. Um, I see this, um, and as Anne mentioned as well, as really a stepping stone for changing how we view the world and that's really powerful. So well done to our fantastic pa panel members this evening. Now we have another ACCELN broadcast next week and we're still finalising all the details for that. Uh, please check our wiki homepage for more information in the coming days and you can also join our ACCE Learning Network community on Google Plus and we will actually invite you to get an event notification and that will pop into your calendar and you'll have a notification, makes it easier. Hopefully we're going to be talking about um, a group around STEM um, and the things that they've been doing there. Roland is typing this as I speak. <laughs> if you'd like to be part of a future show, please let us know. And remember, you can always view our past recordings by going to accelen.wikispaces.com. Lovely to have you join us this evening and watch our show. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Bye, everyone. Bye.